following review for Portal 2 is very in-depth and contains spoilers for every aspect of both Portal 1 and Portal 2. If you haven't played these games, then I advise you not to watch any further until you've done so. Seriously, I'm about to spoil everything, so stop now if you haven't played them, you've been warned. There's spoilers everywhere. The very first trailer for Portal 1 had me enthralled. Placing portals on different surfaces to solve puzzles is an imaginative and immediately interesting game mechanic. But when Portal released, there was a surprise in store. Not only was the gameplay great, but it featured some of the best writing ever seen in a computer game. Gladys brought the empty halls of Aperture Science to life. Her dialogue was cold, mechanical, but draped in an endearing sense of black humour. The game could have been labelled great on its gameplay alone, but it was the successful implementation of Gladys and the atmosphere that brought to the game that elevated it into something more. Still hold Portal 1 in high regard, so naturally I went into Portal 2 with high hopes. If you want the short version of this review, here it is. My expectations were mostly met. Mostly. It's rare though that a game polarises my opinion on so many fronts, so I wanted to go in depth about the ways that I think Portal 2 succeeded, and, kind of more importantly, the ways I think it didn't. The very beginning of the game is similar to Portal 1, with the player awakening out of stasis. The best thing about the opening sequence is the time lapse after Shell goes back to sleep. It grabs your attention and relays important information about the state of the facility. I do have one minor gripe about Wheatley that annoyed me more and more as the game went on. He doesn't sound like a robot. Stephen Merchant turns in a pretty good performance for the character, but he's got a distinctive voice and he's playing a character which is very similar to other characters he's played, so at times it was immersion breaking to be hearing his voice so clearly when every other robot in the game has some kind of distortion on them. A little distortion would have gone a long way towards making Wheatley more believable, and could have even given the performance a bit more range. For example, these four characters are all voiced by the same person. Why don't you go ahead and have yourself a little lady break and I'll just take it from here. Whales are twice as intelligent and three times as delicious as humans. And I think we can agree that Gladys just wouldn't have the same charm if not for the distorted auto-tune-like effect on her voice. I digress though, the game gets going and Wheatley brings us to the portal gun. The murals here look nice and they're an effective way of recapping the events of the first game without boring us with dialogue. A couple of the test chambers are the exact same as they were in the first game, but at this stage that's alright. It's nostalgic, it gets us thinking with portals again, and it lets people new to the series get used to the concept. You're basically in the training phase, but at least the progression is quick. However, even well into the game when Gladys has taken back control of the facility, some of the test chambers are still repeats from Portal 1. I can kind of get why these puzzles are here. They made great training exercises in the first game, so they're still great training exercises in the second game. But they're hardly very satisfying for anybody who played Portal 1. Turns out solving the same puzzle twice doesn't give much of a rewarding feeling. Here we go! Now, do it again. And... Nothing. Alright, can't blame you for trying. Okay, new tests. New tests. Gotta be some tests around here somewhere. The style of these segments is great. The plant life and rundown nature of the facility add a new twist on the visuals of the first game and keep things fresh. More impressive though is the way the facility comes back together as you move through it. You can hardly go a few feet without some panel moving back into place or the layout of a room rearranging itself in some small way. This helps the otherwise static environments feel more engaging. It also helps to invoke the feeling of being a rat trapped in a maze. The gameplay in this segment is equally worthy of praise. It introduces us to several new and old elements, lasers, aerial faith plates, excursion funnels, turrets, hard light bridges, and redirection cubes. The new elements are all great additions, and the puzzles that introduce them get the point across well. It's also in this stage of the game that one of my favourite little touches becomes apparent, which is the way the music is implemented. Usually there's some light background music, but at times it gets a little more louder or more complex. It's actually programmed to do this the closer you get to solving the puzzle you're presented with. Here's the most obvious example. In this chamber you have to line up three lasers with the locks. The more you get in place, the more obvious the music becomes.
effect is actually present throughout the whole game. It's there when you bounce or slide on gels, when you fly through the air, when you knock over turrets, basically whatever your objective is at the time. It's a great and subtle way to give positive feedback to the player. The music itself is easily the best soundtrack Valve have ever produced for one of their games. It does a great job of capturing the atmosphere of the facility. At the moment you can download it from the Portal website for free, all 60 or so tracks of it. I'd recommend it, with music this great it's kind of a shame that most of the time you're not hearing all the layers, or it's just sitting quietly in the background being talked over. I really enjoyed how the music was implemented overall, but some more scenes where the music could take on more of a presence would have been a nice touch, mostly just because it's of such high quality. Anyway, Gladys is now openly hostile towards Jell, which is a logical progression for her character, but I can't help but feel like the execution misses the mark. In the first game it's established at the end that Gladys had killed the staff of the entire facility with neurotoxin. It makes her intimidating, and it was a good position for the character to be in, she is after all the antagonist. Now she's back in a position of power and seeking revenge, and what we get is... Most people emerge from suspension terribly undernourished. I want to congratulate you on beating the odds and somehow managing to pack on a few pounds. Fat jokes. I get that a large part of Gladys' character is her misunderstanding of humans. In the first game she tempts Shell with cake, but the implied joke, the real element of the joke that makes it work, is that we know Gladys would tempt everyone with cake. She doesn't properly understand humans, and that's funny. The fat jokes and stuff play into this, but is this really all we get? It seems like a missed opportunity to have the game take on a darker tone, if only temporarily. Gladys could even have still redeemed herself, and it might make it all the more interesting if she had been intimidating to begin with. I'm not saying the dialogue is bad, but the tone is off compared to the first game. I think rather than make something in keeping with the tone of the first game, Valve went more with what the community's idea of the first game was. The standout moments, you know, the cake, the companion cube, the funny stuff. The dialogue in Portal 2 tries to be funny so often that some of the atmosphere and the integrity of Gladys as a character was lost in the process. Ironically, one thing I think they handled very well were the callbacks to jokes from the first game. Vaporizing the companion cubes, the cake dispensary door. These are light, they're funny, and most importantly, they don't feel forced. On the flip side, the potato jokes do feel forced, like an effort to recapture the viral nature of the jokes in the first game. In fact, Valve had a huge potato team marketing push before the game was even released and anyone had any idea what the potatoes were about. Anyway, the Wheatley scene is very well done. It's got a nice mix of humour and plot advancement. And then we're dropped down the shaft and the game continues on. Old Aperture is the best part of the game. It comes from basically nowhere and it's the closest the game ever comes to capturing the surprise and unknown of the first game. Surprise! The new loading screens with the various old Aperture logos are a nice touch. Opening the vault is cool. Flying through the old Aperture logo is cool. And then we meet Cave Johnson. If the tone of the game was a little bit off before, now it tips over into the point of no return. Cave Johnson is an interesting idea, and I can understand why the choices were made to include him in the game. But from the very second line of dialogue Cave has, it becomes apparent that the game has slipped into sounding like a cartoon. Those of you who volunteered to be injected with praying mantis DNA... I've got some good news and some bad news. Bad news is we're postponing those tests indefinitely. Good news is we've got a much better test for you. Fighting an army of mantis men. Pick up a rifle and follow the yellow line. You'll know when the test starts. The problem I have with Cave Johnson isn't that he isn't funny. It's that there seems to be no consideration for anything but telling jokes. Cave barely has a line of dialogue that doesn't lead to some ridiculous joke. And I get the feeling that nobody really asked if this was worth it. I mean, I know Aperture has always been full of insane scientists, and that's part of the charm. But now they've implied that in the Half-Life and Portal universe, there once existed a race of mantis men created by Aperture. This is all for the sake of one throwaway joke that wasn't even that funny. It's a bit too all over the place. We get details of so many ludicrous, random experiments that I cease to be surprised by any of it. Strangely, having a gun that can bend space by creating portals is more believable than scientists turning someone's blood into peanut water. I just don't think the jokes that we got were worth it. It starts to sound like a cartoon, and it damages the otherwise wonderful universe that Valve have created in Half-Life and Portal. Cave's delivery, though, is fantastic and basically saves the role. So it doesn't take long until you get to the mobility gels, another new introduction, and they're pretty great. The problem is more training. More tutorial-like puzzles are still being thrown at us halfway through the game. It's kind of forgivable here, since the gels are at least a cool concept and are pretty unexpected if you haven't had them spoil on you. 
The main problem with the old aperture sections, though, is the parts outside the test chambers. The only real way to describe these segments is dull. There's so much black space and a scant few areas to place portals that the puzzles, if you can call them that, basically solve themselves. I wonder where I'm supposed to put the portal. I wonder where I'm supposed to put the portal. I wonder where I'm supposed to put the portal. Compare it to Portal 1. The areas in the game had, in general, a bit more white space. Even though this seems advantageous in a lot of cases, it actually makes the puzzles more difficult because you have to think for yourself. And while this is only a major issue in old Aperture and the spaces between the chambers, it's also present to a lesser degree throughout the whole game. There's less white space. Sometimes in Portal 2 I found myself just firing portals on the few white spaces and figuring out what order I had to do things. This didn't feel satisfying and it didn't even really feel like solving a puzzle. This also hurts replayability because there's usually only one way to get through the chambers. Despite my issue with the cartoony nature of Cave Johnson's monologues, I do think the story in this section of the game was very well implemented. Rather than have some character directly tell us anything about the downfall of Apture, we get to see it happen over the course of time as we move through the facility. Unfortunately, this is also where the Caroline stuff rears its head. The idea that Gladys is, at least in part, based on a human is a very strange direction, but I could understand it if it was presented as a twist, or if Caroline had any depth as a character so that we could grow to like her, or have any opinion of her at all. This is a compilation of all the dialogue Caroline has in the game. Welcome, gentlemen, to Aperture Science. Astronauts, war heroes, Olympians, you're here because we want the best. And you are it. So, who is ready to make some science? I am. <laughs> now, you already met one another on the limo ride over, so let me introduce myself. I'm Cave Johnson. I own the place. That eager voice you heard is the lovely Carolyn, my assistant. Rest assured, she has transferred your honorarium to the charitable organization of your choice. Isn't that right, Carolyn? Yes, sir, Mr. Johnson. She's the backbone of this facility. Pretty as a postcard, too. Sorry, fellas. She's married. To science. We're not going to release this stuff into the wild until it's good and damn ready, so as long as you keep yourself in top physical form, there will always be a limo waiting for you. Say goodbye, Carolyn. Goodbye, Carolyn. She is a gem. Black Mesa can eat my bankrupt... Sir, the testing? Right. Now, you might be asking yourself, Cave, just how difficult are these tests? What was in that phone book of a contract I signed? Am I in danger? Let me answer those questions with a question. Who wants to make $60? Cash. The quicker you get through, the quicker you'll get your 60 bucks. Carolyn, are the compensation vouchers ready? Yes, sir, Mr. Johnson. Boy, did I just... Who is that? What the hell is going on here? That didn't take long, did it? And not only is she barely in the game, but the stuff she does says is of no consequence whatsoever. The only thing we have coming close to a personality trait is that she seems a bit ditzy. I can understand maybe if they had used it as a twist, but whatever surprise is there, not much, let's be honest, is blown anyway the second Gladys hears Cave and speaks Carolyn's line. For a long time I didn't understand the reason they included her in the game at all. Then I listened to the audio commentary. The character of Carolyn came about because we wanted somebody for Cave to play off of. Though we had originally envisioned a put-upon scientist character called Greg, it would have been wasteful to hire an actor for just one or two lines. Instead, we hit upon the idea of economizing by using Gladys actor Ellen McLean. Out of nowhere, we suddenly had an opportunity for a Gladys origin story. Origin story? More like... unnecessary story. This was pretty pointless. I mean, it doesn't really serve any purpose other than to make Gladys a little bit more relatable in the most contrived way possible by making her human and you know it changes Gladys for the worse so I think this is the biggest misstep in the story of Portal 2. So we go to the rest of the old Aperture levels with Gladys on the gun as a potato. A potato which magically doesn't disintegrate in the emancipation grids for no reason and don't tell me she turns off the grids or makes them safe for herself somehow because she's actually switched off in the first grid you go through. I don't like to be pedantic about minor inconsistencies in the game, really, I don't. Let me give you some examples. Why did Cave Johnson spend 70 million dollars on moon rocks when he could have just put a portal on the moon? It seems to me like Cave would enjoy putting a portal on the moon, so why didn't they just collect the rocks that way? If you think about how easy it was for Shell to survive this at the end, 
They could have definitely pulled that off and for a lot cheaper. In preparation for this review, I've replayed Portal 1 and Portal 2, listened to the audio commentary for Portal 1, listened to the audio commentary for Portal 2, read the final hours of Portal 2, listened to interviews with Valve employees, read other online reviews and opinions on forums, and contemplated suicide. Now, this figure is never mentioned in the actual games, but I've seen the figure 50,000 years thrown around a lot. So, I think we can assume that Portal 2 takes place 50,000 years after Portal 1. This lemon is looking pretty good. Anyway, none of these points really matter to the story all that much. You can suspend your disbelief about stuff that doesn't matter, even if it doesn't make sense. Unless it's sitting on the end of your gun, in your sight the whole time, doing nothing as you pass through the emancipation grids. Given the fact that about half of the total time you're playing, some character is talking at you, you'd think they could sneak in an explanation for this somewhere. Old Aperture is also the section of the game where the Source engine shows the most age. The art direction is nice, and a needed change of pace from the sterile environments at the start of the game, but the engine lets it down a bit. The Source engine has been continually updated since its inception, but Valve games have always had this problem where everything is straight edged and basically just looks like geometry. For most of the areas in the Portal games this isn't an issue. The environments have a very clinical, clean sort of look to them that works well enough in the engine. However, in some of the lower areas in the game it feels more fake than it should. The walls all look like flat, uninteresting, perfectly smooth pieces of concrete with edges sharp enough to split atoms. I might be wrong here, but the little bit of messing around I've done in the hammer editor, I think this is where the issue arises from. It doesn't seem easily capable of making naturalistic looking terrain and objects. Everything's just very square. The other thing that makes this problem worse though is the fact that Valve never seemed to put any sort of bump mapping on their objects. If they are doing any sort of added work on their textures, I haven't noticed it. At all. This game was made in 2011 and the textures have less going on than some PS2 games. It'd be wrong to slam the game's graphics and performance in general though. Uh, apart from a few aforementioned issues, it looks good and if you go back and play Portal 1 you might be surprised at how dated it looks now in comparison. In particular the artists seem to have had more time and resources available to improve the way the game looks on virtually every level compared to the original. Anyway, back up to Wheatley who is now in charge of the facility. The itch that Wheatley and Gladys feel when in charge is explained. It's a good excuse for Gladys's constant testing, and I think it would have been good enough to make Gladys more relatable by itself, without the Caroline subplot. The interactions between Gladys and Wheatley are great, but this section goes on with puzzles barely more complex than the ones before. Keep in mind that at this point in the game we've been introduced to portals, the various mobility gels, turrets, lasers, cubes, redirection cubes, hard light bridges, excursion funnels, and aerial faith plates but none of the puzzles ever use more than a couple of these elements at once. This is why the gameplay in Portal 2 never reaches its full potential. I can understand why Valve were wary of creating puzzles that would be too complex. I can't imagine that spending years of hard work on a game, only to have most of the people who play it never see all the way to the end is a very good feeling. 
they had crafted something enjoyable, cinematic, funny. They wanted people to see it all the way through to the end. I think the gameplay suffered for this though, and don't get me wrong, it was still a great game. All the new elements they added in fit really well, but it just didn't push far enough, instead it fell short. And speaking of short, the game only clocked in around 7 hours for me on the first playthrough. The co-op is lengthy enough to make up for this somewhat at least. The end boss fight is essentially a repeat of the one from the first game. The cores are entertaining and the moon part is clever, particularly because we're told beforehand that the white gel is made of moon rocks. It's understood what to do intuitively. Although I suppose it is the only white space on screen. I wonder where I'm supposed to put the portal. Now, this might just be me taking this the wrong way, but I think the moon sequence contains probably the most obnoxious thing in the game. Okay, so Shell gets sucked out into space and then we see the moon landing site. Now, I might be wrong here, but considering how pointless and unlikely this is, I get the feeling that they put this bit in just to make sure that people knew they were on the moon. It's like they're still holding my hand through the ending cutscene. Anyway, during the fight, Wheatley talked about the fact that I had dropped him earlier in the game. At first I thought this was a nice touch. I thought the dialogue had changed depending on what had happened. It turns out though that you can't catch Wheatley when he pops off the rail. Catch me, catch me, catch me, catch me! Ow! Ow! You can't change anything in the game at all. It even gets insulting at the part where you pick up Gladys as a potato. She's just sitting there, begging you to pick her up or do something. But if you try to leave the room, you can't. So you walk into this room, and then, for no reason, if you choose not to pick up Gladys, the door is locked behind you until you pick her up. Well, it's not for no reason, is it? It's so nobody can walk away from her and get themselves stuck. I get why this makes sense from a gameplay perspective. But it's a bit of a slap in the face. Call me cold-hearted, but if someone starts playing Portal 2, a puzzle game, and walks into the room with Gladys, and then walks back out of the room without picking her up, and then never goes back into the room to pick her up or interact with her in any way, even though she's asking them to, then I think it's okay that that person never gets to finish the game. Anyway, I'm not asking for some major decisions that change the course of the story. Honestly, most games which implement stuff like that suffer hugely in the writing department because they're too washed down with possibilities. But I think there could have been a couple more slightly divergent sections where actions you take could be referenced later on. I find it odd that Valve didn't put in at least some dynamic speech, considering this is the same studio that produced Team Fortress 2 and Left 4 Dead, games which you can play for hundreds of hours and still hear new lines of speech. The same stuff is also in the upcoming Dota 2. Portal is more reliant on good writing than any of these, so why not stick in a few lines for repeat playthroughs? Thankfully, the co-op campaign is a nice addition to the game. Gladys feels more similar in tone to the original, the puzzles are more challenging, Having four portals opens up new possibilities, and there are some other nice additions as well. The picture-in-picture -picture view of what your ally is seeing is particularly handy for getting a grasp on your surroundings. And the pointers you can leave on the map, essentially asking your ally to place the portal there, are a fast and easy way to communicate without saying a word. The robots are full of personality too, even though they don't say anything. Their animations are superb, and it's rewarding to see them give each other a high five or a hug. There's more to the co-op than I expected, it took about four hours to get through the first time, and since then, Valve have released another batch of free levels for people to sync their portals into. I'm torn on the issue about whether or not the game even needed co-op, though. It's fun, but I can't help but feel that it was constructed at the expense of the single player, which was disappointingly short. Valve have always been keen to try new methods of distributing their games. That's why Steam exists in the first place. They went through an episodic phase with the Half-Life episodes, but then when Team Fortress and its free updates were a big success, Gabe Newell said they were more interested in software as a service. That's where a product is provided, maybe only partially complete, and updated continuously for a time. People continue to use it and pay for the software in whatever way, say digital hats, and the software continues to grow. I think a big part of the reason why there's co-op in Portal 2 is because Valve were subscribing to this development methodology. This seems like really the wrong approach for a series like Portal though. Just like in Team Fortress 2, there's a digital hat store in Portal 2 for your robots. But I find it hard to believe that this will ever make a fraction of the money they get from TF2, simply because you only play co-op with one other person at a time, and the robots have strong identities as is. Paying so you can stick a hat on a robot that one person will see is just not an attractive prospect, especially compared to Team Fortress. I don't know, Portal just seems to me like the kind of series where you make a strong single player experience, a complete package, and then you move on to the next thing. I might be wrong, Valve are working on a level editor, 
and I'm sure some more official levels are probably in the pipeline too. Maybe Portal 2 Corp will really take off and then I'll have to eat all my digital hats. None of this is to say I didn't enjoy the co-op, I really did, and in some aspects it's the best part of the game, it's certainly the most challenging and the most rewarding part. You just need to make sure you play with a friend naturally to get the best experience. Even though I've focused on the negative elements in this review, I think I should stress here that overall Portal 2 is a great package. If I was to go in depth about all the ways I think the game succeeded, this video would be much, much longer. The writing and performances are crisp and only ever really miss the mark and tone. The gameplay introduces a lot of new elements which see some good use. It's got so much going for it, but its potential was even higher. If I could just rid myself of that slightly disappointed feeling I get when I'm finished, I'd stop calling it a great game and start calling it an amazing one. I was tempted to leave this review here, and I suppose the review section of this video is over, but I think it's worthwhile to discuss something called F-Stop. See, back when Portal 2 started development, it was a totally different game, and the code name for that game was F-Stop. It was a game set in Aperture back in the 1950s and would feature an entirely new puzzle mechanic instead of Portals. It wouldn't even have Gladys or Shell. Instead, Cave Johnson was going to be the antagonist. Valve haven't told anyone what the mechanic was because they were very excited about it and might put it to use in future products. All we know is the team were very eager to work on this new idea. They worked on it for months and they put together a prototype. Unfortunately, when they handed the game to playtesters, they got negative feedback. The playtester said they wanted portals and they wanted Gladys. And suddenly some of the team members lost faith in the idea. Eventually they scrapped F-Stop and decided they needed to put Portals and Gladys back in the game. Valve take playtesting very seriously, even recording the faces of their playtesters so that level designers can smooth out bumps where the player becomes frustrated or bored, and this is definitely one of the reasons why they've been so successful as a developer. I don't have any more concrete information on F-Stop, and what I'm going to say after this is just my opinion on the matter. One of the reasons, maybe the major reason, why Portal 1 was such a huge success was the element of surprise. It was a refreshing gameplay mechanic, the story was surprisingly good, the game went on longer than you thought it would, it toyed with the player at several points, overall it just felt like a breath of fresh air, especially to someone who's played a lot of computer games. And that's the thing, again I'm just speculating here, but many of the people who played Portal 1 probably wouldn't have played it if not for someone they knew who had already played it, telling them it was great. It was a word of mouth type of thing. Some people aren't all that interested in trying new games until they see there's some sort of movement behind it, or at least someone they know tells them they're missing out. As well as that, it's natural that some people will become attached to the concept and characters of the first game. Obviously, this can be taken to an unhealthy degree, though, where it stifles creativity and the ability to accept change. Imagine the reverse. Imagine if F-Stop had been made back in 2007, and Valve decided to make Portal now. It's not hard to see that people might have had the same reaction, Portals are stupid, I thought this was an F-Stop game, where's Cave Johnson? Maybe the playtesters who were brought to Valve for F-Stop just needed someone to play the game before them and tell them how great it was, so they could be convinced to let go of their expectations and enjoy a refreshing new idea. Like I said, Valve's playtesting has brought them a lot of success in the past. I find it odd though that a company can have such an amazing repertoire of games and yet abandon a new idea simply because some people whined that they wanted to hear Gladys again. I still think Portal 2 turned out great, but I can't help but wonder what could have been, and I just want Valve to have a bit more faith in themselves. I know I've got plenty to spare.